It's now my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest and investiture speaker, Dr. Robert Metcalf. Each year, the Thayer School recognizes a graduate or friend of the school with the Robert Fletcher Award, which is given in recognition of distinguished achievement and service in the highest tradition of the school. This is the highest honor conveyed by the Thayer School of Engineering faculty and staff. When Robert Fletcher was selected by General Sylvanus Thayer and Dartmouth President Gaza Dodge Smith to become Thayer School's first dean and professor in 1870, he was a 23-year-old Army lieutenant serving as an assistant professor of mathematics at the U.S. Military Academy. Over the ensuing 65 years of service to Thayer School, a record that I fear may not be broken, and the neighboring community, Fletcher was to leave a strong, lasting impression on generation after generation of students. His accomplishments as director and teacher almost invariably merged in the minds of students with his quality as a human being. As Sylvanus Thayer was recognized as the father of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, so was Robert Fletcher recognized as the father of the Thayer School of Engineering. And to our graduates, if you have ever taken the time to look at the pictures of the graduating classes from the early years of Thayer School that adorned the hallways in Cummings Hall, you can see a progression of Professor Fletcher, Dean Fletcher's contributions and membership of the faculty over this incredible 65-year period of service. As the school grew from just a few students and a single faculty member, Dean Fletcher, to the vibrant institution it has become. In addition to leading the engineering school, Fletcher designed and supervised construction of bridges across the Connecticut and White Rivers, waterworks for the towns of Hanover and Enfield, and served for more than 40 years as president and engineer of the Hanover Water Company. His many activities contributed not just only to the prestige of the school, but to the betterment of the community and the advancement of engineering education. The individuals selected to receive Thayer School's Robert Fletcher Award must possess the qualities exemplified in the life and the work of this remarkable individual. Today we are honored to present the Robert Fletcher Award to Dr. Robert M. Metcalf, Professor of Innovation in the Cochrane School of Engineering at the University of Texas and the Fellow of the Clint Murchison Senior Chair of Free Enterprise and a Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. The Academy, however, is only the most recent career path undertaken by this extraordinary and immensely energetic individual who pursued at least four careers, each of which would have been significant in its own right in technology innovation before joining the UT Austin faculty last year. As an engineer scientist in the 1970s, Dr. Metcalf helped pioneer technology leading to the internet. And in 1973, at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, he was one of the inventors of Ethernet, the local area networking standard on which he shares four patents. Between 1979 and 1990, Dr. Metcalf pursued a career as an entrepreneur and executive, where he founded and grew 3Com Corporation, persuading Digital Equipment Corporation, Intel, and Xerox to work together to promote Ethernet as a standard. By the end of the 1980s, Ethernet was clearly the dominant network technology and 3Com the major player in this area. After stepping down as CEO of 3Com in 1990, Dr. Metcalf launched the next extraordinary chapter of his career as a publisher and technology journalist. For most of the next decade, he wrote extensively on technology and engineering, serving from 1992 to 1995 as CEO of InfoWorld, a publishing company, then focusing his writing and for many years publishing a weekly InfoWorld column from the ether. Some of these columns were collected into the book Internet Collapses, published in 2000. In 2001, his career took another turn when he joined Polaris Venture Partners as a venture partner in their Waltham, Massachusetts office, helping to nurture many successful companies along the road to technology development and commercial success. And finally, or perhaps it's better to say more recently, Dr. Metcalf joined the faculty of the University of Texas at Austin, where he recently launched a new course called One Semester Startup, an interdisciplinary entrepreneurship practicum for teams of students focused on starting companies. Over his 40-year career as an inventor, entrepreneur, executive, journalist, publisher, venture capitalist, and professor, 
Dr. Metcalf has acquired many, many awards and honors. These include the Bell Medal and the Medal of Honor from the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE. In 1995, election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 1997, election to the National Academy of Engineering, the highest award and honor that the engineering profession recognizes. He received the Marconi Prize in 2003, the National Medal of Technology in 2005, and was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 2007. Dr. Metcalf holds two bachelor's degrees from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, he is a life member of the MIT Board of Trustees, and holds master's and PhD degrees from Harvard University. Dr. Robert M. Metcalf, today it is my distinct pleasure and honor to present you with Thayer School's highest honor, the Robert Fletcher Award, in recognition of this four-decade career of distinguished achievement as an engineer, an innovator, an entrepreneur, and an educator. Thank you. Congratulations.
That's odd advice. Now, to end these uh, wisdoms, I'd now like to insert the secret of happiness, which was famously noted by Charles Kingsley in the 19th century and was painstakingly reconfirmed by me during the 20th century. And here it is. I'm going to save you a lot of trouble. All we need to make us really happy is something to be enthusiastic about. So what am I enthusiastic about? A lot of things, but in particular engineering. If, if you find life boring, you are not paying attention. If you insist on being a cynical smarty pants, go ahead, but uh, cynics are often right. They never get anything done, and I can assure you they're not happy. So I urge enthusiasm and optimism, and uh, in particular about engineering. Uh, now it will make me happy over the next uh, two hours of my talk. <laughs> to go over some of the ways, in fact, 14, more than 14 of the ways you can have fun in your enthusiastic engineering careers over the next 50 years. During 2007, the National Academy of Engineering assembled 18 genius engineers for the purpose of developing what was called the Engineering Grand Challenges, 14 of them. I don't know why 18 geniuses came up with only 14 grand challenges. I suspect maybe they had an attendance problem. You can find out as much as you want about all these challenges, where else, but on the internet, at engineeringchallenges.org. But let me give you 10 minutes worth of these 14 challenges to be enthusiastic about. Uh, and at the end, I'm going to add a 15th challenge, which the National Academy of Engineering did not uh, include. You can think of others, I bet. And uh, as a bonus, I'm going to give you, I'm going to make a prediction. I'm going to predict what the next, you know, iPod, iPhone, iPad, what's the next i thing? And I'm going to tell you a little later uh, as part of this. But here we go. Engineering challenge, grand challenge, number one. Engineering the tools of discovery. This is the National Academy of Engineering telling the National Science Foundation that the division between science and engineering is not as stark as the silos of our universities would suggest. Nobel Prizes often go to scientists with early access to the latest discovery tools, which were, of course, cobbled together by mere engineers. And many of the best scientists are sometimes engineers of their own tools. And sometimes, vice versa, engineers need to discover their own new knowledge in order to solve the problems at hand. That is, the distinction between science and engineering is overplayed. Number two grand challenges, two and three, energy, particularly solar and fusion. So we need to solve energy. We want abundant, squanderably abundant, cheap and clean energy. NAE suggests solar and fusion. So my picture is that Earth is a natural fission reactor whose thermalized radioactive decay has for five billion years kept our planet from becoming a permanent snowball. So we can harvest that energy, and the way we do is often called geothermal. Or we can build our own artificial fission reactors. We have 104 of them here in the United States uh, in order to produce cheap and clean and reliable energy. So it'll be interesting to see what you all do in getting us cleaner, cheaper, non-proliferating, smaller uh, fission reactors, or you may punt fission altogether and go on to, say, fusion. Fusion energy is more promising by a factor of a million, uh, but it's also more difficult. I'd like to point out that every day a fusion reactor flies across the sky, taunting physicists everywhere. <laughs> we harvest that energy, uh, transmitted, radiated fusion energy, of course, through uh, various forms of what we call solar energy. And it appears that in this decade, we're going to make solar energy, in particular through photovoltaics, cheaper than coal. This very decade, it looks, and you're, you're probably going to finish the job for us. Grand challenge number four and five are two elements, carbon and nitrogen. I'm not a chemist, but we seem to be putting too much uh, carbon into the Earth's atmosphere and taking too much nitrogen out. 
And the NAE thinks what we need to do is expensively sequester CO2. Expensively sequester CO2. My suggestion is that we learn to profitably harvest CO2. Uh, and I leave it to you. Number six is water. Millions of us die each year because of a lack of potable water. Uh, we need to learn how to purify and desalinate and distribute water. Abundant energy would help with that. We do have the oceans blue. 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by water to an average depth of 12,000 feet. So there's lots of water out there. I think there's hope we can solve water. Challenge number seven is urban infrastructure. Humans are flocking to cities by the billions. Among our urgent uh, needs in urban technology have to do with the food chain and sustaining it as we urbanize and also for transportation. Let's take transportation. A million people die every year in car accidents. Would somebody from FAIR please engineer electric cars that drive themselves? I am sick and tired of buying cars, and I don't like waiting online at the Department of Motor Vehicles for my license. Or to put it another way, when I need a car, there should be an app for that. <laughs> Number eight, medicines. Just as physics gave rise to electrical engineering, now biology has given rise to bioengineering, especially at Dartmouth. And we're moving from what they call drug discovery to actually engineering drugs. Uh, modern medical research, as you know better than most here in Hanover, uh, requires as many engineers as biologists and doctors. And I, I would also suggest leavening in a few entrepreneurs. But let's remember that uh, you know, 30 years were added to the human lifespan in, in the last century, the 20th century, but only five of those 30 years were added, added by advances in medicine. <coughs> the other 25 years were added by what's called public health. And so let's be sure to do some engineering of public health, and I'd recommend that we start with obesity. I should talk. <laughs> uh, the thing about obesity is it is now threatening to reverse the trend that we've had of increasing life expectancy. So we need to get on that public health challenge. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Challenge number nine, reverse engineering the brain. We have uh, three reasons to do that. One is for fixing the many brains that are broken. The other is developing ways to make our computers better by mimicking the brain. And third is enhancing our brain so we can think superhumanly. I'm, I'm waiting for my Google implant. <laughs> this is going to be fun because we're going to discover what it's like to be human, exactly what it's like to be human. And I expect that we're going to, this very century, we're going to move from carbon-based to silicon-based life forms, or the other way around. We're going to move from silicon-based to carbon-based. I can't wait to find out what you all come up with. Challenge number 10, health informatics. The internet has disrupted a series of industries. You know the list. Uh, uh, the Postal Service, Telegraphy, Telephony, TV, Books, Music, Shopping, Photography, Advertising, Politics, Newspapers, Journalism, and Dating. <laughs> Such disruption is a good thing, by the way, unless it's happening to you. And, and three of the next big industries ripe for disruption are energy, education, to which I'll return, and healthcare. I think we need to figure out how to get healthcare onto the internet. Grand challenges number 11 and 12. Securing cyberspace and deterring nuclear terror. I guess I'm not an expert in those, but I can say that uh, maybe uh, we were engineers have to remember to go back and clean up the messes we make. And perhaps we need to do a better job, without becoming Luddites, of uh, anticipating and mitigating the messes in advance. Number 13, enhancing virtual reality. I'm not sure why the 18 geniuses put this on their list. I would rather we enhance real reality. Uh, but this leads to my prediction about the next gadget that we're all going to be wearing in design, various designer colors. And, and I wore a pair last week, in San, a week before last in San Francisco, and I'm now like, I, I'm going to dub them for the moment, I'm going to call them eye, eye, eye glasses. <laughs> So seeing through internet-enabled eyeglasses 
Uh, we could go into HD virtual reality if we wanted, but I think we'll enjoy enhanced reality, like we can be able to see at night and uh, get timely reminders of names and parties. <laughs> <laughs> to me, the question is, what will be the killer app of my glasses? What will it be? We'll find out in the next few years. And last, the 14th grand challenge is personalized learning. So education is next up on the list of grand disruptions by the internet. And I'm reminded of the Stanford professor who recently put his uh, artificial intelligence course up on the internet and got 100,000 people to register for the course, and then 20,000 of them earned certificates of completion. This professor quickly then left Stanford to join a startup that will soon offer all of computer science to the whole world through some variation of internet education. At my alma mater, MIT, a professor there put circuits and signals up on the internet, his course. Immediately, when I say immediately, within two weeks, 100,000 people had registered for that course. So now MIT has joined with Harvard in a $30 million a year effort called edX to try to figure out how to, what to do with this enormous disruption and opportunity of online education. Uh, and I suppose they're going to have to figure out some sort of sustainable business model. So there's a, a lot of engineering ahead on that project. Uh, does anyone remember Polaroid and Kodak? <laughs> So let this be a warning to our schools, colleges, and universities. Uh, Polaroid and Kodak could not see that their cameras would soon be replaced by interconnected mobile telephones and the internet. Uh, and um, they are bankrupt now. So could this happen to MIT? Harvard, probably. <laughs> but certainly not to dark. <laughs> All right, so those are the National Academy's 14 grand challenges, and I think it's going to be, I think you will agree, it's going to be pretty exciting to take on some of those challenges, and I can't wait to get to them. And of course, we'll be modifying the list because there's the next 50 years, but you young immortals have to worry about the 50 years after that, and then the 50 years after that, so we have to keep the list dynamic, so I'd like to add a grand challenge. And uh, this grand challenge I'll put under the rubric asteroids. Uh, although they were certainly before my time, some of you may remember dinosaurs. 65 million years ago, an asteroid randomly wiped out the dinosaurs. More recently, May 28th and May 29th, two previously unknown asteroids zipped between Earth and the Moon, traveling at 20,000 kilometers per something. It doesn't matter whether she was <laughs> NASA knows about thousands of asteroids large enough and close enough to threaten life on Earth. I'm worried about the million asteroids that they don't know about. If global warming has you worried, then asteroids should scare the hell out of you. Or, Asteroids should look like the funnest engineering challenge not here on Earth. So I think we should, as uh, grand challenge number 14, is learn to detect and deflect asteroids uh, using space robots, probably. Who, who would want to work on that? <laughs> In fact, there's a company, a new company called, uh, what's it called? Planetary Resources in Seattle that's just been formed. They're not content to detect and deflect they want to capture and mine asteroids. And some of these asteroids are estimated to be worth, just one asteroid, to be worth over a trillion dollars in, in rare metals. So uh, I urge you, don't jump up right now and run off to Seattle. They are hiring, I might add. <laughs> but don't jump up now because you still have yet to get your degrees and you have yet to sufficiently thank your family and friends here. Uh, but after that, after all of that, uh, I urge you enthusiastically to commence your engineering careers. Thank you.